It is December 2017, and locals are mourning a tragedy. In Tacoma, they should be happy. They have just received a new train service after all. But instead, the new Amtrak passenger offering has created the wrong type of disruption to local travel plans, in the form of destruction and death. The accident would highlight a failure in the fundamentals of operating a railway and show how far behind Amtrak was in train protection compared to their contemporaries around the world. My name is John and today we're looking at the 2017 Washington train crash. Background. Our story starts in 1971 and the commencement of a new passenger rail corridor named Amtrak Cascades. The route takes 467 miles or 752 kilometers from Vancouver, British Columbia through Seattle, Washington and Portland, Oregon to Eugene, Oregon. Parts of the route date back even further, as far back as the railway's early days. But today we're just going to focus on one small section of this vast route, the Point Defiance Line. This route follows the coastline of the Puget Sound between the cities of Tacoma and DuPont. It was opened in 1914 as a bypass to the Prairie Lines, direct but difficult to drive 2.2 degree incline over 2.2 miles. The Point Defiance line had to play to two needs, both passenger and freight services, with passengers demanding higher service frequency and freight demanding greater loading gauges to allow larger cargo, the two requirements were at odds with one another. As such, two tunnels on the line were converted from double track to single track to allow freight services to carry large Boeing aircraft parts. As such, this severely hampered passenger service frequency. Thus, an alternative to what was once an alternative was needed. This brought in 1992 with the Washington State Department of Transport beginning to search for a new route and their gaze fell upon the old prairie line to the north and the American Lake Branch to the south. WSDOT published its plan for the Amtrak Cascades service. It set out all the work required to reinstate the bypass and it would turn out to be a pretty big project. It would involve new track signalling at grade crossings and a new bridge and straightened curve over the I-5 near the Niskali River. The bridge and straightened curve would have cost in excess of $230 million. This part of the project, unsurprisingly, was shelved because of cost concerns. After all, the whole project had only been greenlit for $183 million. And thus, the tight curve remained but with the addition of a permanent speed restriction. The line had a maximum permissible speed of 79 miles an hour, which was reduced to 30 for the curve near the Niskali River. To give advance warning to the driver, yellow and black boards are placed two miles from the speed restriction. The project began in 2010 and was mainly completed in 2017, apart from one big thing. That was positive train control which will prove to be a fatal shortcoming. Amtrak wanted to get the Cascade service running on the new route as soon as possible, but it had to train its engineers, also known as drivers, and conductors on the route. Training for drivers over the route would involve the use of familiar locomotives as well as a new locomotive named the Charger. The Charger was first unveiled to the public in 2016, and made its way to the Cascade services in mid-2017. When the Charger locomotive first appeared on the Cascade's roster, drivers were initially trained on the locomotive in group sessions. This involved classroom time, as well as being shown the operating compartment, and familiarisation with the display screens and controls. Vitally, however, these sessions did not involve any actual driving time and observation rides were only occasionally conducted on the Charger. Training for the new route included a number of observation rides, then making two northbound and one southbound trip. While driving the train under supervision, 
of a road foreman. During risk assessing the route, the tight curve near the Nescali River was highlighted as a key point of interest in the line's characteristics. Drivers during their training are meant to learn braking points for stations and speed restrictions, and the new route was no different. Some would use the mile point signs to help identify their location. A written exam on the physical characteristics of the territory, which included a question about the curve at MP198, was included in the training for drivers. But crucially, it didn't question potential landmarks that could be used to keep situational awareness during a trip. Training was deemed adequate by Amtrak, but from an outsider's point of view, three trips in total over the route and not multiple trips in varying times of day does seem a little lacklustre. The training outlined here was exactly what one driver would undertake before becoming the inaugural engineer on the first passenger service on this new route. The disaster. It is the morning of the 18th of December 2017 and the engineer of train 501 is receiving a call from Antrak's designated on the job trainer. During the call, the two talk about the route and the tight curve at mile point 19.8. You see, today is an important day. It marks the first passenger service over the new line. The driver isn't alone today in the cab for this run. He is accompanied by a qualifying conductor who is there to learn the route. The train consists of the new Charger locomotive, 12 carriages and a rear locomotive. The engineer had worked for Amtrak since the 17th of May 2004, initially as a conductor for several years, but eventually becoming a certified engineer on the 26th of August 2013. He was experienced and by all reports was a safe and conscientious driver. Train 501 departed the Holgate Street facility at 6.09am and made its short journey to the first stop at King Street Station. At this time the train was running 10 minutes late but nothing really to worry about. The train continued on to Tacoma Dome Station in doing so, entering the Point Defiance bypass route. The engineer and qualifying conductor spoke infrequently about the route characteristics and general work topics. Due to the time of day and year, it was still dark outside. As train 501 passed the points for the DuPont Yard, the engineer called out his location. At 7.32 and 16 seconds a.m., the train went past the advanced speed restriction sign at MP178, roughly two miles before the dangerous curve. The engineer intended to apply the brakes at the sign indicating control point 188, roughly one mile before the curve, and near a signal box. As the train approached the controlling signal, the headlights washed out the sign and the engineer missed his braking point. At 7.33 and 6 seconds a.m., the sign the mile post 19 went past. This was roughly one half of a mile from the curve and still no braking application was made. Suddenly an overspeed alarm started to sound. The engineer, unfamiliar with the charger locomotive, didn't react to the warnings. He saw the signal at mile post 19.8 and initially thought they were at control point 188, but it was too late. Aboard were five Amtrak employees, a technician from the train manufacturer Talgo and 77 passengers. At 7.33 minutes and 34 seconds a.m., the concrete structural walls came into view on both sides of the track, leading to the 30 mile an hour restriction. The train was travelling at 83 miles an hour. Realising the mistake, the engineer was recorded on the cab recorder saying, we're dead. Seconds later, and at 78 miles an hour, train 501 hit the curve over two times the maximum permissible speed. The engineer didn't make any emergency brake application. It was now 7.34am. The lead charger locomotive and seven coaches behind derailed. The locomotive and a few coaches slammed down the embankment beyond the curve, blocking the southbound lanes of the I-5. 
The lead locomotive spilled 350 US gallons, or 1300 litres of fuel, onto the I-5. The only part of the train that remained on the track was the rear locomotive. Eight vehicles were damaged by the train crashing down, injuring eight of the ten people using the I-5. Many passengers were able to escape the wrecked train, but some were severely injured and trapped. At 7.36am, the first 911 calls came in, and within four minutes, the first emergency responders, in the form of DuPont police, arrived to assist. Local emergency services were quick to attend, to shut the I-5 and attend to the wounded. The most severely injured were sent to multiple hospitals in the region. Sadly, three on board the service were killed in the accident. All were passengers and were travelling on the train to celebrate the new route. Surprisingly, the engineer and qualifying conductor survived the crash. This would prove to be vital in the later NTSB investigation. All rail services were diverted along the old route, and all services along the Point Defiance diversion were cancelled until the line was fully protected by positive train control, which would prove to take a good few years to implement. On the 20th of December, two southbound lanes of the I-5 were reopened after some of the wreckage was removed. In total, the destruction and cleanup would cost in excess of $40 million, which would include the writing off of train 501. Now, with such a dramatic crash on a new route with a new locomotive and with an experienced engineer, how was the train driven at 78 miles an hour around a 30 mile an hour curve? Well, the NTSB would have a go at trying to find out. The investigation. Well, luckily, having the engineer not dead meant that they had some first hand information. Needless to say, he was interviewed and it was found that he was not distracted during the drive. However, he was clearly not familiar enough with the line. He had passed all the assessments, which along with his previously good driving record, would hint that maybe the training wasn't up to scratch. But on the railway you don't want to rely on one failure point, in this case the engineer. Ideally, there would be a system in place to mitigate against this. And there was positive train control but it hadn't been fully installed on the route. In the NTSB's final report, they summarised the root cause of the crash. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the Amtrak 501 derailment was Central Puget Sound Regional Transport Authority's failure to provide an effective mitigation for the hazardous curve without positive train control in place which allowed the Amtrak engineer to enter the 30 mile an hour curve at too high of a speed, due to his inadequate training on the territory and inadequate training on the newer equipment. Contributing to the accident was the state of Washington's Department of Transport's decision to start revenue service without being assured that safety certification and verification had been completed to the level determined in the preliminary hazard assessment. Which is pretty damning. Now the root cause was the driver not having the correct route knowledge. Route knowledge is vital irrespective if it's a tram, freight train, tube train or suburban train. The knowledge of the road is absolutely vital in order to operate a train safely. Most train drivers know their routes intimately. They know every line side feature, landmark, signal and sign they pass. As such, they even know when such things are missing, such as a sign being graffitied or a signal being taken out of use. Clearly the driver hadn't received the proper training to know the route he was driving, and as such, this was the main cause of the disaster. Also the driver was unfamiliar with the locomotive they were operating. Railway rolling stock is not the easiest to understand if you're not familiar with it. In comparison to say my OPZ for example, which is known to have a fairly steep learning curve, it is still designed with the user in mind. As such, different colours light up for different operations and for the buttons that are pressed. However, train cabs are often devoid of any mod cons or user benefits. They are much more utilitarian, and as such, you need to be trained on the proper operation and the different types of warning lights and sounds that can be given to you in certain situations. 
Again, the lack of training caused this unfamiliarity with this particular type of rolling stock, which confused the driver at a vitally important time. It felt like it was all a bit of a rush job trying to get this new service running on this previously unused bit of track, and it was the victims that paid the price. Personally though, the engineer not making any emergency brake application is a little concerning. At least in the UK, you are taught if you lose situational awareness, then you throw on those brakes and readjust and regain your bearings. Another issue is the size of the speed reduction warning board, especially when compared to a Morpeth board, or officially warning indicator. The one on the point defiance bypass seems, well, a little, little. The line today is now back in use after extensive testing services resumed on November 18th, 2021.